to our benchmark webinar series. Um, today we're going to do things a little bit differently, as we saw in the uh, advertisements we sent out. So I'm joined today with our senior, by our senior associate, Fernanda Ospina, who has a background in uh, accounting and finance. She um, was a uh, financial analyst at a telecoms company, and then went on to become a controller at a uh, agricultural business, a very large agricultural business, uh, before coming to join us here at Benchmark. And so her job at Benchmark here involves primarily um, digging through clients' financials, assisting them with all the accounting and financial issues they're going to come up during the course of the transaction. So she's been here what, over five years, I think? Yeah. Well, over five years at Benchmark. Uh, and in that time, she's worked with you know dozens of clients, helping them successfully exit their business and fight off the uh, various attacks from the buyers, as well as helping to put together the marketing materials to paint the best possible picture of uh, the client's business going into the transaction. Uh, and that's why she was a natural person to join me uh, on the webinar today. So she's got a bit fresher perspective than I do. It's been a while since I've done that work. Um, and she's in the trenches in there every day, um, fighting these battles so, you know, with buyers and, and helping sellers um, get, get through this and understand uh, a lot of the accounting and financial issues their business that are going to be relevant to selling and valuing the business. Um, so as always on our webinars, there's a little box up on the right hand side of your screen, a little orange arrow. And if you click on that, there will be some um, publications uh, that we've prepared that we think are relevant to today's discussion. Um, and we've added a little bit to that this time with the bios on the two of us here. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we're joined today by Wade instead of Sam, who will be receiving questions. Feel free to use the little uh, comment box down below to send in questions at any time. Um, Wade will answer some of those questions in real time. Others he'll save uh, and ask us at the end when we have time for the Q&A. So um, don't worry about uh, waiting until the end. If you've got a good question, send it in, and that way you won't forget it by the end. Um, and then we've got a third new feature over on the right-hand side. We've got um, a short questionnaire um, that you can answer if you would like to. Uh, at the end of this webinar, we're also going to have a little pop-up on your screen um, to uh, a different type of questionnaire that's a little, little bit more focused on the technical aspects of the webinar. We want to make sure that we're getting this right for you. So, um, what are we talking about today? So, today we're talking about um, valuation, which is something that we often talk about. But if you see the slide there, we often talk, as does you know most of the popular literature, mergers and acquisitions, about the right-hand uh, variable in that equation, which is the multiple. How do you get the highest multiple? What kind of multiple can my business get? Um, and everyone just kind of takes the left-hand side of that equation, the EBITDA for granted. There's not a lot of discussion about that, but um, you know, it, it, basic math indicates to us that when you have two variables in an equation, uh, there's no coefficient on them. One of them is just as valuable as the other. So raising the multiple by 10% is the exact same as raising the EBITDA by 10%. So while the multiple gets a lot of the attention out of the market uh, in the media, um, today we want to talk about the kind of the less uh, obvious thing to talk about, which is the EBITDA, right? Because what we're trying to do is get the highest number in both variables to get the highest overall enterprise value. So um, I'm going to be asking Fernanda some questions, and then I'll chime in if anything she says reminds me of something from back when I was in the trenches working on on the on the EBITDA side of the equation. Um, and we're going to break the discussion today into three parts. So the first part. Um, let's talk about, to make sure we're all starting from the same place, what EBITDA means. So, Fernando, when a, when a buyer talks about EBITDA, what, what is that term? What does it mean? Well, before we start talking about what they mean with EBITDA, we should probably understand why they look at EBITDA when borrowing their businesses. Um, and the simple reason is because EBITDA is a proxy for cash flows. So, you would think, like, well, why don't they just use the statement of cash flows instead to calculate this? Well, they could do that, but we have found that in this sector, the lower middle market, most um, owners are just business operators, so they really have a better idea of what this uh, cash flow of the business is without relying on the same cash flow. And they really look at that as just some um, fancy financial statement that the accountants put together, and they don't really use it. Do most of our clients have statements of cash flows? Most of them don't, but they do have income statements and um, balance sheets, of course, and buyers understand that. So it has become customary for buyers to look at um, the income statement to calculate the earnings of the business and have that proxy for cash flow. 
because they are very interested in what the future cash flow business could possibly look like when you know after they buy it. Um, so they want to calculate what that earnings and possible cash flow really is because um, you know it has been proven that high cash flows result in high business and high uh, price for the enterprise. So so our clients give us balance sheets and income statements. And they go to get the EBITDA, where do they look on those two statements? So we're going to be focusing on the income statement or P&L, profit and loss statement, all is the same, uh, different ways of calling it. So we're going to be focusing on the income. Okay, so the letters are all capitalized, E-B-I-T-A, which indicates to me that they mean something. So, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but EBITDA is not defined by GAAP. It is not. Okay, so we have to come up with the definition of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're, but I think there's a little bit of play in what those letters stand for exactly. So let's walk through each one of them, starting with the E. Mm -hmm. So that's earnings. So EBITDA really stands for earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So how do we get there? Um, so we start from the income statement. So you're going to have your net revenues, less any direct cost or cost of goods sold, arrive to your gross profit. From there, subtract any operating expenses or SGNA, all is the same, to arrive to your net income. And from there is where we're going to be adding back those I, T, P, and A. So net income and earnings being the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is the net income always the bottom row of a client's or a seller's or a business's um, financial state income statement? Mm -hmm. Well, depending on which ones you're looking at. So if you're looking at some accountant prepared documents, such as the audit or review statement, a compile statement, uh, sometimes the bottom line has additional information underneath, like um, distributions that were made or any dividends that were paid or any sort of notes that the accountant might have added regarding the income. Statement. But if you're looking at some internal statement that came directly from the accounting software, then yes, most likely is going to be the bottom line of that PL. Okay, so so if, if a business owner is looking at an accountant prepared uh, financial statement or income statement and they see distributions on there, for example, you say the distributions are relevant or irrelevant to either the irrelevant. irrelevant. They are okay. under under the line, so we're not gonna have to have So everything we're talking about today is at the net income or earnings line or above. And everything below it, if there's anything totally irrelevant. Okay. All right, so that's the E, then comes the I, T, D, A. So the I, tell us about the I. So that's for interest. So any interest that the business might have paid for, um, you know, interest on a loan or interest on a line of credit. So those expenses get added back until they keep it up. So I, sometimes I think I've seen clients have interest income mm -hmm. uh, up near the top of their income statement. And that's not an ad back, is it? No. So we want to look at interest expense. Expense. Okay. So they all the I, the T, the D, and the A are all. We're just looking strictly at expenses to add back. Okay. So interest. That one's pretty straightforward, I think. Then um, taxes. Companies pay all kinds of taxes. <laughs> Which do. taxes matter? So the taxes that matter are federal and state income taxes. So this T does not include any taxes for payroll or property taxes, so it's mainly federal or state income tax. Okay, and so a lot of our clients, uh, I believe, and a lot of small businesses in the lower middle markets are S-Corps or another way to say it, tax pass-through entity, mm -hmm. so a lot of them won't have any interest to add back, although I think there's some states that don't recognize the um, tax pass-through status. So I think in Georgia, for example, um, recently looking at something there where if the owners Sorry, Tennessee. If the owners of the business don't live in Tennessee, the state won't rep won't recognize the tax pass through status, and they'll charge a corporate income tax mm -hmm. on the entity. Mm -hmm. So there might be some times I think where there would be even if someone is elected under federal taxes to have their company be a tax pass through entity, uh, there might still be a little sliver of state income tax mm -hmm. on the corporation. Now, and we're not talking about in the S corp the tax that the owner pays, are we? No, no, no. So if it's tax pass through entity, probably no taxes uh, to add back, but maybe depending on the state that the company is organized in, there might still be a state income tax mm -hmm. um, 
uh, slab there to, to take a look at. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that's the interest. D for depreciation, everyone's favorite. So. <laughs> yeah, so depreciation is depreciation expense on any capitalized fixed asset. So you capitalize big fixed assets over their life or useful lives. Uh, so this is depreciation that is found most likely under the operating expenses. Um, some businesses do put it up on their direct cost, depending on the type of business that they are. So when we're looking at EBITDA, we want to make sure that we're capturing 100% of the depreciation expense, whether it was recognized as an operating expense or, or as a direct expense. You know. Would a company ever have some up in the top and then some in the bottom, and you could add back both? Yeah, yeah. You want to make sure that it's 100%, whether it's a little bit from operating and a little from um, direct cost. Yeah, and I think this is where, if I remember, sometimes we would see people go to the balance sheet because they'd see the word depreciation there. They see accumulated depreciation. It was a big number, and then they're tempted to put that in the ad back. But that's we're not talking about accumulated depreciation. We're talking about Actually, depreciation <laughs> expense on the income statement, whether it's at the top of the income statement or towards the bottom of the income statement, or both. That's the depreciation. Correct. Okay, amortization. The, lesser known cousin of depreciation. What's the difference between depreciation and amortization? Uh, so that is for intangible assets. So think of goodwill, trademarks, patents, those type of uh, fixed assets are intangible. So they don't get depreciated, but you um, put an amortization on them um, over a, a certain period of time. So slight depreciation, but for intangible exactly. assets. And I think we probably don't see a lot of that not in right. lower middle markets. No, not really. Yeah. Okay. You, you, very few, but if, if you do have it in the PL, you, know, you want to make sure that you capture it um, so you are correctly stating what they can put for that business. Okay, and so that gives us something that is called book EBITDA, which is the, the EBITDA as reported on the financial statements of the company. Um, and so that's actually the easy part of this EBITDA variable on the equation. So now we'll talk a little bit more about how you take that book EBITDA and you squeeze more value out of it. So um, so we start with the EBITDA, the book EBITDA, as reported on the financial statements, and then what do we do to it? Um, so that's really where we try to answer what uh, EBITDA means when the buyers are talking about it. Um, so they most likely are referencing an adjusted EBITDA. So we want to make sure that we go in and identify any sort of addbacks or adjustments to this EBITDA. So you would think, okay, what type of addbacks do business normally have? Uh, so one that is very common is any discretionary uh, type of adjustment. So any personal uh, expenses that the company might have put through the business that are not necessarily business related. Again, cell phones, vehicles, um, taking some extra people on some business travel, maybe some sports tickets, um, things that the system is set up, you know, the tax system in particular is set up to encourage and allow business owners to call these business expenses, but in the hands of a buyer um, that will be, you know, kind of a larger company, not an owner operator, they're going to elect and not put those things in the business because, um, you know, the legitimate interest of an owner operator is keeping the tax as low as possible. Um, and that means keeping the EBITDA down or just the profitability of the company down. Whereas a lot of times, um, Buyers that are not owner operators are a little bit bigger. They may be publicly traded. They may be a private equity fund, and they're willing to pay that extra tax, uh, even though they could avoid it. Um, they're willing to pay it because they're more interested in having a higher profitability level to show their investors or to show the public markets. So, in the owner's, the current owner's discretion, it's a business expense. Exactly. In the buyer's discretion, it's not a business expense. And so what we're trying to do there, right, is we're trying to take EBITDA and say, what would the EBITDA have been historically if the new owner had owned the business instead of the old owner, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the discretionary piece, yeah? Um, so what about the, the non-recurring or abnormal or one-time expenses? Yeah, those can also be added back. So any one-time bad debt that the company might have had to do, um, uh, capital expense in the P&L, uh, we will want to add those back as well because, for example, one customer defaulted on their payment and that usually doesn't happen, so it's a one-time expense. So anything that is abnormal, they had a big repair to do that year, we can add that back. So repair, maintenance, any legal fees that they might have had, 
um, in the course of the year, we can add those back. So any non-recurrent abnormal expenses can be added back for that adjustment. So, so if the business has, you know, twenty thousand dollars in legal expenses every year, mm. we're not going to add those back every year, right? Because no. then it's not one time. Even if they say, well, this this year I got sued for a slip and fall on my property. This year I got sued by an employee that I let go. This year I got sued by a supplier for a late payment. Uh, and it's always twenty thousand dollars. At some point, it's not abnormal, right? Exactly. So even though each one of those have, is abnormal, buyer probably would look at that and say, I think that business probably is going to always have twenty thousand dollars of legal expenses. Exactly. So, but in one year, that. that twenty thousand becomes ninety thousand. We could technically add back the difference, right? Because every year it's twenty thousand dollars, but that particular year it was higher for whatever reason. So we we can add back the difference. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And then also not market size things. So we're thinking about anything that is like excess compensation. So if the if the owner of the business is paying themselves a little bit higher, that is, um, you know, when compared to a market size compensation, we can add back the difference if they're paying a family member any sort of salary, but that person is not involved in the business, then that also could be added back or even rent. So if it's not a market rent expense, uh, we could also bring it down to whatever the market rent is and add back the difference on that as well. Yeah, as I recall, we see a lot of clients that pay above market rents when they have an affiliate owned business in real estate because I think the tax, they can get a lower tax on that money if the business collected it as rent as opposed to the operating company collecting it as their regular revenue. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a little bit of a legitimate um, tax play there that pops up, I think, quite often, if I remember correctly, yeah. for our clients. Yeah. Yeah, those are very common and buyers are very accustomed to that. So they kind of expect businesses to have those typical adjustments throughout the year. So what's, how do you ensure that the buyers are going to agree that they're legitimate ad backs? Yeah, so we want to make sure that we have a good story and we have a strong documentation behind them. Uh, because we want to make sure that they are giving them the highest weight as possible. Uh, so the better story we have, the better documentation behind them, the more support we would be able to. Okay. Good documentation and a proper story. So the the doc, how do how you know? So there's a way that we help clients do. What's the what's the best way that clients can get that story and documentation together? What's you know I don't know what they just struggle, but how do we do it for people so that they want to figure out how to do it? What's the, what are the keys to that? Um, just provide information to us. So, for example, if there is some sort of extra compensation, we will want to look at their W-2s, their payroll reports, to be able to show that, yes, in fact, that this person was paid oh, this yeah. month. I remember I remember when I first came to benchmark, there was a client that was adamant that his his um, salary was like $300,000, and his total payroll was like $400,000. And we said, wow, you've got 20 other people. You're not paying them very much. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that's what it is. That's what it is. And we kept saying, give us a W two. Well, my taxes are being redone by my accountant, so he has my W two. I don't have a copy of it. Come on, give us a W two. And we had a buyer who was saying the same thing at the time. This was a very early days, uh, and the buyer was saying, um, "I can't believe he's not really taking three hundred thousand. And um, so we got really far along in the deal. We got pretty close to the end. Then the W two appeared and said like one hundred twenty thousand. Mm. And we asked the client, well, why are you saying 300000 And he was saying, I take 120000 salary, I take 180000 of dividends and distributions. And so we said, you know, that's below the earnings. That's probably why I mentioned that earlier was that exact case. Blew the deal, had to start over. Ever since then, we always asked for our clients W-2s before we would make any, any uh, compensation adjustment. You, the, 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 the seller really needs to be able to show a W-2 that says, yes, this is how much the company paid me in the form of compensation, not dividends, not any other way the money got in my pocket, but um, exactly compensation. Yeah, that's, that's a common issue, yeah. I know. Yeah, because we want to make sure that these expenses are truly hitting the income statement. We don't want to take out something that is not there to begin with, such as the distribution. Uh, yeah. uh, so good documentation such as W-2s or any sort of payroll report is important when making compensation adjustments. Uh, if it's a one-time adjustment, so if it's a legal fee, we want to make sure that there is something supporting that, in fact, that fee was paid on that particular year. Um, 
so you know good documentation any sort of reports that they can show uh, that those adjustments are needed, the better and i think with, with your the third bullet point we had there about uh, excess uh, excess expenses um so like an excess rent or excess compensation another piece of that was what well, we can still go out and we'll, we'll get um we'll either have a real estate person look at the market rent um, and kind of get the substantiation that the market rent should be x not y and if it's compensation we also have the resources uh, internally to go out but it's important to understand what the market rent is so if, a, if a, someone selling their business just says i take a two hundred thousand dollar salary but i think market's a hundred thousand and they're just kind of saying a hundred thousand mm -hmm. i don't think the buyers are going to it, when I was having those discussions, buyers wouldn't accept that. I imagine it's still the case. Yeah, it is still the case, definitely. That's why we want to have as much of uh, information as possible at the beginning of the process, yeah. because we know the type of questions that buyers are going to ask is typically the same. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're not uh, relying on our clients to take the time later on in the process after we've already found a buyer to provide us information that we need over the time. Uh, and we want to make sure that the EBITDA that we're presenting or the adjusted EBITDA that we're presenting at the beginning of the process is as real as possible. Because the last thing we want to do is just somebody put in uh, a multiple in this adjusted EBITDA that we're presenting and then have it discounted down um, after they find out that it's not a true adjustment. Yeah. Like and I would imagine if you have, say, three or four um, adjustments to EBITDA, and you, it's like any any type of negotiation or discussion in life you have three you raise three or four points if someone shoots a hole in one of those points then the other three or the other two or three are now subject to you know they're very vulnerable and it's going to be harder to defend the three good ones if you get caught on a bad one right off the bat and then you have a more skeptical buyer and they're going to want to do more diligence and they're going to just think that they can keep pushing and pushing so i would say sometimes you know there's a chance where you might be adding back a hundred thousand dollars and leave it uh and it's a judgment call, a lot of judgment calls on that back. So it's a judgment call. There might be a time where you say, look, it'd be really nice to have that 100000 but we got another you know, $600,000 in that back, so rock solid. How much do we want to push that as a, a decision for the seller to make? Um, you know, So on the ad backs, lots of judgment required. Um, some I've seen some people just try to throw in everything in the kitchen sink, and, and I every time I remember that's always backfired. So yeah. um, judgment is important. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we're talking about EBITDA. I think we got a good idea of, of the kind of mathematical components of EBITDA and where to look for it. But you know, EBITDA is over a time period. There's like earnings are over a time period. What's the most common time period that, that um, buyers are going to look for um, to, to plug a number in? Is it one month's worth of EBITDA or 10 years worth of EBITDA? Or what, what time period are they looking for? So typically, it's between four and five historical periods. Um, and most importantly, the trailing 12 months, especially when we are talking about a deal through the, you know, through the middle of the year. We want to make sure that we're presenting the last 12 months of results, especially if the business is in a growing stage. Yeah. So for any growing businesses, we want to make sure that we're looking at the latest 12 month period. But historically, buyers are going to be interested to know, um, you know, the last four or five years results. So formulaically, the, the, num the number that goes into that equation is 12 months of EBITDA. And it's, it's some version of the most recent form of 12 months. But you said the buyers are going to want to look back four or five years. Why, if we're only using, you know, 12 months in the formula, do those earlier two or three, four years matter? Well, it depends on the type of business it is. So it's, if it's a business that historically has been performing very much the same every year with just a little bit of growth here and there, then um, buyers are going to most likely take an average of the last four or five years to come up with their valuation. Uh, however, if it's a growing business, yes, we're gonna push to for the valuation to be on that latest 12 months because it is the highest um, EBITDA number. However, they want to see how this company has been growing to sort of have a feeling on how sustainable this growth really is. Yeah, I think we worked on a deal two years ago. It was a um, design engineer, mm -hmm. and he had kind of, um, you know, three years of EBITDA, and then the last 12 months was up here. And we took in the market, and we wanted a multiple based off of this number. And I remember a lot of the buyers saying, nice number, but, you know, was it a one time? event or, you know is this sustainable as a future owner what kind of earnings should i suspect this or this and we were on a market for like a year 
because we were holding to get that EBITDA to be used in the formula. And um, we ended up closing out a second year with the client at that same level. And then once we had two years at that level, I remember it was way easier. The offers were substantially higher than that one year. So even though the, the number of dollars in the formula for EBITDA didn't change, it changed a little bit, there's a little growth, but it didn't change materially. The buyer's willingness to accept that number that we were putting forth went up astronomically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, definitely. I mean, buyers are going to want to know the sustainability of any type of growth, whether it's looking back or whether it's looking at the um, company's work in progress and backlog and that sort of information, you know, okay, what type of um, earnings are expected in the future. Yeah. All right. So before we get on part two, that's the end of our kind of defining EBITDA um, uh, portion of the webinar. So it's a good time if you have any questions on what we just covered, it's a good time to just wait. Uh, and again, you'll either answer them uh, on the fly or if there are questions that's good for the whole audience, we'll save them and ask Fernando and I uh, at the end. So we'll move on to part two. Um, and part two is, you know, now that we've come up with our EBITDA that we're using for the seller's concept of value and the EBITDA we want to put forward in the marketing materials and hopefully get the buyers to use, the buyers aren't going to come in and say, oh, your EBITDA is too low. I think it should be higher for the following reasons. They're more likely to come in and say, well, nice EBITDA, but I don't agree with it. So they're going to play what I call games because I, I, you know, been representing sellers so long. But, you know, there's, they have a legitimate um, reason to look at the EBITDA numbers and verify the EBITDA numbers and make sure they're not getting um, taken to the cleaners. But I still call it games that buyers play. So part two here, we're going to talk about a couple of the games that buyers play with EBITDA. Um, so um, the seasonality game. So what do we mean by seasonality when we talk about EBITDA? So it's something that definitely buyers are going to be looking at. So they're going to be looking not only at the historical annual results, but also the historical um, monthly statement. They want to see if there is any specific uh, month that the results are higher versus lower because at the end of the day, yes, buyers are going to want to find anything they can to drive the valuation down. But it is our job to drive valuation as high as possible with the results that we have for every specific company. So when they're looking at this monthly statements, they want to see if in fact there is this particular 12 month period where it might be better to do the deal because the value of the business could potentially be lower. Uh, but it is our job to make sure that we're analyzing this month financial statements to take the best of month that represents the true earnings of the company. Yeah, so, so you're saying monthly financial statements are important. Even though it's a 12-month period that goes into the formula, we still want to know the monthlies because the buyers can move a little bit forward or backwards um, to try to minimize that EBITDA. Yeah. Um, so that kind of leads into what I always call the which 12 months game. So, so here we are sitting on uh, you know, early October, middle of October. Um, we've got a couple options for what we could do the valuation based on. We could use um, the company's last fiscal year, which is almost the same as the last calendar year. So we could use the 12 months that ended uh, December 31st, 2017. Um, or maybe we could use the second half of 2017, the first half of 2018, or maybe we could use the first three quarters of 2018 and the last quarter of 2017. Um, or we could use right up until, you know, the last financial statements that companies have, which in this case would be the same as the three quarters of 2018 and one quarter of 2017. But suppose we're in November, right? We could use um, um, November 1st of last year through October 31st of this year, if we were sitting a month from now. Yeah. So, um, this game of kind of which 12 months do we use? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, exactly. So we want to make sure that we're strategic when we are presenting, you know, the, the latest 12 month available. Um, because for example, if last year, October was, um, you know, kind of low and this year, October is pretty high, we definitely want to make sure that we're including the strongest October possible in that 12 month period. But if it's the other way around, we may want to keep the, prior 12 months instead of, um, you know, including that low October for this year. So we want to make sure that we're strategic when we are using what 12 months in our, you know, LOIs versus agreements. Yeah, because the buyer is going to be equally strategic in <laughs> their course. 12 months, right? So there's going to, there's oftentimes when you have a company, this numbers bounce around a bit, you have a negotiation between 
which 12 months is the relevant 12 months. Mm -hmm. So you might as well start, you know, from your best position and think strategically because they're certainly going to think strategically. Mm -hmm. um, all right, next issue, capital expenditures. So before we say how buyers manipulate that, first let's be a little basic and start back with what are capital expenditures? So we mentioned it a little bit when I was talking about depreciation expense at the beginning of the conversation, um, but capital expenditures are essentially um, fixed assets that get capitalized throughout the um, life of um, the expected life of that equipment or that machinery. Uh, so it's usually big fixed assets that the company uh, purchases. So what type of games do they buy or do they play? So when we talked at the beginning about depreciation, we said, well, let's make sure that we're adding back 100% of the depreciation expense. However, if a business is CapEx heavy, or if they do have capital expenditures, high capital expenditures every year, then buyers are going to most likely expect to have those capital expenditures moving forward. So if it's a CapEx heavy type of business, then buyers most likely are not going to add back 100% of that depreciation. Well, they do in order to get to EBITDA, but then they do a negative adjustment to make up the difference between what has been depreciated and what the regular capital expenditures for the business. Yeah, I think I've seen that pop up on a lot of um, rental equipment companies. Mm -hmm. So if they're running like uh, construction equipment, they go out and make these big purchases and they'll rent the equipment out for five, 10 or 15 years and then they'll sell it and buy new stuff. So mm -hmm. it's like every year they're buying, you know, maybe you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of, of heavy equipment. Um, but then they're able to just depreciate a huge mm -hmm. amount of that expense in the future. But every year they have that same CapEx. So I've seen buyers come in and say, you know, I'm going to have, that same cash outlay every year because I have to keep replenishing equipment, so I can't, I can't let, I can't base my valuation on that. And sometimes what they'll, if I remember, they'll say, I'm going to do my formula is going to be EBIT times multiple. So they'll, they won't, give, they'll try to say, you know, just EBIT, no depreciation, no amortization, because the capex expenses are constant, right? And so then, you know, we have to push back to that. Yeah. And, and we get into no, it's EBITDA, but okay, it's some concession for this, and you have to sell it's another negotiating point exactly. in the deal. Yeah. So, oh, so I think that's one game they'll play with CapEx is the, as you said, the, um, the yeah, hey, it happens all the time, so I can't give you credit for it. But I think also sometimes we see um, where, like, there's different ways to do depreciation, right? So, so first of all, there's tax depreciation versus accounting depreciation. And so, which, which depreciation expense is usually larger, people's tax depreciation or their um, gap or accounting depreciation? Um, usually the tax depreciation tax is depreciation. higher. Yeah, yeah, it's usually, you know, like a double decline in depreciation, of course, that is done to lower your taxes. You know, you, you want to lower that tax liability. Um, but what's important to do is whether you're looking at the, you know, that compliant financial statements or your tax return to make sure that you're adding back the depreciation expense that is shown on whichever P and L you're looking at. Yeah, that's interesting. I know that when we go to prepare our clients' financial statements for the market, sometimes we'll use the numbers in their tax returns, and sometimes we'll use their accounting books. Um, so I think pretty clearly, if they have an audit or review, we'll use the accounting books. But sometimes, particularly smaller clients, their their books are a little bit more shaky, maybe they're not quite as detailed. Um, um, and the tax um, tax returns actually give a pretty good set of financial rules, but the rules for tax accounting and gap accounting are, are different in some ways, including in a depreciation. So as you said, the depreciation is faster on the tax returns usually, so the depreciation expense is usually larger. So there's some strategy that goes into that, right? When we're deciding how to present the client and we say, wow, their EBITDA under gap comes out here, and their EBITDA under taxes comes out here, and their accounting books aren't so good that we really have to use them. So maybe we should use the, the depreciation and the other numbers for the tax returns to get a slightly higher EBITDA. Um, and again, the tax returns are pretty good because that, for you know, unless you're publicly traded, your tax returns are the only financial statements you have to stand behind in your company if you're an owner operator. Your internal books can say whatever you want and no one cares, but the tax returns gotta be right. So buyers do like to look at tax returns, even even when um, sellers have audits or reviews, they still want to see the tax returns. 
Um, so when the when the internal accounting books might be a bit weaker, um, buyers will. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to remember that on smaller deals, buyers will rely in some cases primarily on the tax returns mm -hmm. for financial information. Yeah, they do. And then perhaps the tax returns, uh, we will have more adjustments to the tax returns than we do on an internal statement That's or accounting care uh, statements because for tax reasons, they might have accelerated certain expenses or they've uh, um, you know, expense additional personal expenses. So, so you're saying we take the tax returns and we make that book even uh, and then we'll look at their other accounting books and we can make the adjustments or the, the add backs off of things we learn from the financial statements, the internal financial statements, even though we're using the tax records as the book EBITDA and that seems legitimate by buyers. Yeah, the details we can definitely get there. We just want to make sure that those expenses are uh, truly reflected on the tax return. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So now let's move a little bit. So I think a lot of things we've been talking about so far have centered on getting the company ready for market and developing strategy. Um, now let's talk a little bit about kind of the company's been on the market. Now the letter of intent comes in. So um, the quick, quick refresher, letter of intent, um, client goes out to market, there's a few conversations, the, the, the buyers read the information memorandum, there are a few conversations between the potential buyer and the seller, the potential buyer might do a site visit, might do a dinner with the owner, um, maybe in some cases they've only had phone conversations, but the buyer decides that they're ready to make an offer, and they have a valuation in mind, so they will submit what's called a letter of intent, sometimes called a term sheet um, in Europe, uh, more often called a heads of terms, um, but we never hear that in the U.S. really. Um, and it's a non-binding offer to buy the company, but somewhere in the first paragraph of that letter of intent or LOI will be the price of the, that they're willing to pay. So the value that they're going to place on the business. So the letter of intent will then talk a little bit about how they would structure the payment, why they want the business, and you know if there's some real estate terms and some um, compensation terms and who's going to need to sign an employment agreement and some conditions to the offer. Um, but what everyone's always interested in on the LOI is the first paragraph, because that's where that formula of EBITDA times multiple equals enterprise value is usually appears. So there's two ways that the buyers can present the letters of intent. And one is they can say, I'm going to pay $10 million for the company, or I'm willing to pay $10 million for the company subject to the terms and conditions of this letter of intent. So that's, that's one way, there's a per dollar amount. Um, another way, which I think we see 50-50, um, uh, the first way or the second way. And the second way is say, we're willing to pay six times your trailing 12 months EBITDA, which um, based on the EBITDA you gave us of um, one, uh, I'm trying to make the numbers the same. <laughs> Let's say we're gonna pay 10 times your trailing 12 months EBITDA, uh, which based on the numbers you gave us is $1 million. So 1 million times 10 is $10 million. So both option A and option B say $10 million, but they're very different offers, right? So the first one is a hard dollar amount. Second one is they're put laying out that whole formula. And so, um, and they'll usually say, you know, the base even does this, the multiple is that, so the result is this. Um, and they're really two different starting points, but they can kind of lead to the same place because um, in that letter of intent, it's always going to say, subject to our due diligence. Um, and so it's, it, there's a chance that those numbers will change, but you need to understand where you're starting from. And so, you know, even that first option where it says $10 million, the seller is still gonna have to defend the EBITDA because even though the letter of intent doesn't say that the $10 million is based on a historical EBITDA, um, if the historical EBITDA turns out to be lower than what's been shown to the buyer, they're probably gonna move off of that $10 million number. So when that option, that first option comes in, um, it's good to have a discussion at that point in time to understand, okay, you're saying 10 million. Um, what if the EBITDA is a little bit lower, the historical EBITDA is a little bit lower, you're still gonna pay the 10 million? And that's a really good time to nail down what they mean when they just say 10 million. So um, that's the easier option. Um, sometimes what you get when you ask that is they say, well, I said 10 million, but what I meant is 10 times your $1 million of EBITDA. Oh, so now you wrote it this way, but what you really mean is option two. So, okay, so I'm going to have to prove to you as the seller that my EBITDA was $1 million. Okay, in order for me to do that, I need to know exactly what time period you're talking about. Are you talking about my 2017 EBITDA 
or my currently 12 months up until the date you sent this letter of intent or up until the last month that closed before you signed this letter of intent. Um, but you need to get very specific because what happens is if you don't get specific at that point, the buyer then waits, does their due diligence and comes back and says, yes, your 2017 EBITDA was $1 million, um, but your trailing 12 months through you know September 30th of 2018 was 890,000, so I have to lower my offer. So if you don't clarify it, you're leaving the buyer the option to pick that time that we yeah. talked about. So that is exactly the time to get in there and say, okay, you're saying it's, it's an EBITDA, let's, let's define the EBITDA. So one thing to talk about is the time period. Um, and then I kind of jumped ahead, but that was the slide for that one. Um, what time period are they using, right? But then the other important question to ask is, again, regardless of whether they did option A or option B, if they do option, the first option, $10 million, but it's subject to verification of EBITDA, or if they say a multiple times a conservative EBITDA, you nail down a time period, and then you say, you accept my ad facts, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and you're probably never gonna get a buyer who says right off the bat, yes, all of your ad facts are good. Yeah. But you, the conversation can be more philosophical at least. So philosophically, do you, I, I've got a, a $100,000 ad back because the owner has been getting um, $200,000 a year, and our market data says that's a $100,000 a year position. Um, do you agree with that? And they, you know, they would hopefully say, philosophically, I agree that we should add back excess compensation. And 100,000 sounds about like the right number, but I'll have to verify it. That's probably as good as you can get on like an excess compensation add back verification. Um, you know, but if it's something like bad debt, uh, sometimes buyers will go back and say, no, I never give add backs for bad debt because I'm going to have bad debt occasionally too as the buyer. So, um, you know, if they're just going to flat out deny an add back, then that needs to be known to the seller before they agree. Because even though that says 1 million times 10, uh, um, a $10 million purchase price, the, if the seller's already thinking in their head, huh, I'm going to take, you know, a million dollars off that because it's a hundred thousand dollar add back. I don't agree to. So you want to get that verification that you, and you're just never going to get 100%, but at least you can get a philosophical, you know, yes, that looks like a good ad back, subject to my accountants or whoever verifying that it's actually what happened and that your market number for rent is correct, then, yeah, we'll, we would give you an ad back for excess rent share. So um, you really want to try to get that at that point. All right, so we breeze through that. Before we go on, is there anything else about, I didn't give you a chance to talk. That's my nature, sorry. <laughs> Was there anything? I do, still, right. I do still do a lot of work in letters of intent, so I just went back to my normal uh, monologue voice um, on doing webinars. But anything else? <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, what's important about that is to be able to get those terms correctly put into the LOI. Um, there had had to be some sort of job done before ahead of time to get to that point to begin with. Uh, so that's why it's so important that our adjustments are as clear as possible when we first introduce them with the buyers to begin with. Uh, we have a clear idea as to what type of 12 month period we want to be presenting. Uh, so when it comes time to that conversation, we're already prepared with all the analysis that we already did. Um, and then also prepared to the quality of earnings that is going to be coming in order for the buyers to um, prove that those adjustments are correct or not. Um, so I know the next part is uh, we're going to be talking about quality oh, of right. earnings, yeah. right? Right. So, the, so as I said, the buyers are never going to just say, yes, I agree. Um, before signing the letter of intent, I agree that your EBITDA was $1 million, and I agree that all of your addbacks were absolutely legitimate, no questions, you never get that, yeah? So what you get is this quality of earnings. So um, quality of earnings didn't exist when I was doing a heavy volume of deals, um, but it, accountants did accounting due diligence. So the, the buyers always require due diligence, and they have you know legal due diligence, they may have environmental due diligence, depending on the nature of the business. Um, HR, benefits due diligence, um, tax due diligence, um, but the two biggies are the legal and the accounting due diligence. But no one ever uses the term accounting due diligence anymore. Now they call it quality of earnings. So um, I think accountants tend to be not the sharpest like business people at selling their services usually, um, but whoever invented this concept of quality of earnings was a genius because um, the accounting firms charge pretty heavily for that mm -hmm. to be done, and they're able to sell it like uh, hotcakes. So what is a quality of earnings? 
Uh, so it's essentially accountants going in and trying to understand the accounting department of a business, essentially, how the business uh, recognizes their revenue, how they recognize their expenses, what sort of personal expenses they might be running through the business. Uh, so they're really trying to understand how the accounting of the business really works. And they're basically going to be asking very similar questions to what we did at the beginning of the process when we were preparing our marketing document. Uh, so most of the questions that our clients receive from this quality of earnings um, accountants uh, are going to be the same ones that we already um, introduced to them at the beginning of the process. So our clients are mostly prepared for, for those tough questions that yeah. the accountants have. It's interesting that you, what, the way you described it is very broad. It covers, you said that they want to get a look at the whole accounting department and all the accounting practices. Um, but the title that these wrote, this brilliant accountant is, whoever thought of this, he didn't call it quality of your accounting department. He didn't call it quality of net income. He called it quality of earnings. And earnings is the E of EBITDA. So quality of earnings, I believe, is something that's only done in preparation of this, for the purchase of a business. And they deliberately chose the word earnings because they were going to, I think the accountant's job is to come in and attack the EBITDA. So they could call it quality of adjusted EBITDA, right? Because they're going to look at the earnings and try to say like maybe the revenue was recognized too fast or some expenses weren't were delayed or not reported properly or um, you know they're going to attack the I, the T, the D, and the A as well and then they're going to even come after the adjustments right they're going to look at the adjustments yeah yeah, yeah definitely definitely are going to be looking at the adjustments uh, especially if they are a material amount uh, so they want to make sure that again those excess compensations are real or those one-time expenses are real um, and, you know, any discretionary expenses are truly discretionary and are not going to continue moving forward after the sale. So we want, they want proof. They want those documentation to be provided to them in order to for any sort of adjustment, um, you know, that are showing what the adjusted EBITDA of the business. All right. So we talk about um, games that, um, the way I call it, games that uh, they play with the EBITDA. And the first one comes to my mind is, um, who gets to see the quality of earnings? Well, so first, let's talk about who, who who do we see paying for the quality of earnings report these days? Mm -hmm. So mostly it's the buyer that is paying for that. They, yeah, they're the ones that are getting the benefit off of it. Um, but sometimes they ask for it to be split between the buyers and the sellers. Um, but if they do that, we want to make sure that then the seller side has access to that quality of earnings, especially if they're paying for it. Um, but buyers sometimes don't like to share the quality of earnings for some reason, but if they are making changes or any decisions on what the purchase price of the business is um, based on the quality of earnings report, we definitely want to make sure we are seeing those reports as well. Yeah, it's, so it's uh, it's really odd, you know, as I recall, from any, even when it was called accounting due diligence, the accountants would have like these massive contracts. Well, anybody that sees our report has to sign this thing, and they're basically like, it's one of those things where like, you'll give us your firstborn child and everything and you'll never sue us for anything, right? So if they have like PwC or EY come in and do this and they're asking tons of like global releases in there, you'll never sue, your company will never sue our company for anything. And then you have to, then you have a whole nother negotiation that happens. No, we'll agree not to sue you for anything related to this report, but that's the scope of it because yeah. you may be our auditor someday and you may audit our books or who knows what. So, um, so it really helps, I think, to get that those permissions set up as early as possible in the process. Uh, I just remember getting into some really, some of the nastiest fights I can remember were with, you know, the buyer saying, I'm gonna lower your EBIT to 500,000 because my accountant in the quality of earnings report told me to. And then the seller says, okay, well, I don't understand that. Can you show it to me? No, I'm not allowed to show it to you. Yeah. Well, you can't or you don't want to, two different things. And then you get into that that struggle. So um, there, how often are we seeing quality of earnings, even on our smallest clients? Mm -hmm. I would say the majority of the time, over ninety okay. percent. Over ninety percent. Okay. So yeah. when that letter of intent comes in, we know there's going to be a quality of earnings report. We, we should assume there's going to be a quality of earnings report. So that may be a good time to say, look, you know, we want a copy of of your um, quality of earnings report. So, but again, especially as you said, I think if, if the buyer is asking the seller to pay for a part of it, yeah. Um, and that's, that's a rare case. It's very rare. It but is. if they are, then certainly if you're paying for any piece of it, then you absolutely have the right to receive that, that quality of earnings report. So for me, that's the biggest issue that I've seen with the quality of earnings is, um, is that 
I'm going to use it against you, but I'm not going to show it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, any, other, any other things going on with quality earnings these days that are kind of what I call buyer tricks? Um, that's that's the main one. Uh, and sometimes uh, if they don't hire a good firm, mm -hmm. um, you know, they might take a very long time. And I mean, we say it around here all the time. Uh, time really truly kills deals. Uh, so we want to make sure that, you know, that they send some sort of accounting firm. We kind of have an idea of how they operate and, um, you know, we assess our clients all the time in the process and we want to make sure that even the quality of earnings team is moving things along uh, to not delay the process. What kind of um, accounting firms do we see for quality of earnings for clients that say where the, where the enterprise value is between, say, you know, um, 2 million and 20 million? Are we seeing big four accounting firms, PwC, EY, <laughs> Drew a blank? Uh, I forgot. <laughs> big four, <laughs> used to be the big six, I knew more. So do we see big four accounting firms, mm -hmm. or do we see kind of the next um, the next level more often? We're seeing kind of both. Um, it, it really depends on who the buyer is. Uh, some more sophisticated buyers are just accustomed to working with those, um, you know, big firms, and they naturally go after them. Deloitte and KPMG. There you go. <laughs> I was so, I was so embarrassed. Yeah, like Deloitte and KPMG. So Deloitte, KPMG, PwC, or Pricewaterhouse, and uh, Ernst and Young or EMY. Those are the those are the big four kind of the, used to be the big six. But those are the big four, and they're very expensive. And then the next the next kind of Five or six that I think we see a lot are um, CLA or Clifton Larson Allen, um, Grant Thornton, uh, McGladry. That used to have a different name; it was three letters. Um, but about within the last year, they rebranded as McGladry. Um, CBiz. Yeah. Um, so CBiz, Grant Thornton, McGladry, and um, I just might show you a little off the list. Pro Horwath, another one we see. I think they're kind of more in the east, eastern half of the United States, though. Um, those are names we see a lot. So if you see any of those names, those are probably going to be people that are going to do it pretty quickly and a very thorough job. So I know accounting firms of that size have um, separate departments, right? So almost all of your accounting firms that have more than four or five accountants in them, um, they have it, two departments, tax and audit. And so what what I think you get in trouble too is when someone comes from the tax or the audit department to do quality of earnings. Whereas if you're going one of these top four or kind of the next six or so. And there are some specialty accounting firms that are smaller, but they do this, they have what's called a transaction advisory services team. So it's the third team, there's, there's um, tax, uh, audit, and transaction advisory services. And so these are specialists in doing quality of earnings. And those are the people that are gonna get in, get the right information for the buyer and get back out the fastest. So it really, I think that's a big reason why it's worth, you know, the seller saying at the point of the LOI, who's going to be doing the quality of earnings and then trying to make sure, you know, if you work with you, if you as a buyer work with them before, do they have a dedicated team that does this? Or do they just take whoever, it's not tax season, so they're going to get a tax accountant in here to do this quality of earnings because that's going to take a lot of extra time and raise some issues that probably shouldn't be raised. Um, yeah, they may miss a few things, that would be good, but um, more, they're probably not going to miss as much as they're going to bring in stuff that's not really shouldn't be an issue. So, all right, that um, is the end of our um, prepared remarks and questions. I did have, I have one question though, um, before we before we go to the audience. Um, we said that we only use the income statement for our ad backs and our calculation of EBITDA. Um, but I think there's a circumstance where if a company has a statement of cash flows, there might be some hidden depreciation in there. Can you tell me if I'm wrong or can you explain it? Yeah, definitely. So that's what I was talking about, the depreciation when perhaps they split it between the operating expenses and um, direct cost of goods sold. Um, if they do have the statement of cash flows, there is that one line item talking about depreciation. So whether it's in either side of the income statement, uh, that line item will give you 100% of the depreciation that needs to be added back to cash flows. Keep it up. So okay. that's, you know, if it's available, that, that is a good uh, source to find that, that number. Okay, so that, that's the only time we're going to go outside of the four quarters of the income statement to get our book EBITDA. We might go to the statement of cash flows for depreciation. Make sure we're capturing all of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So with that, uh, we've got about uh, five, six minutes here. Do we have any questions? So wait, have we received any questions? In front of us? Yeah, we, we've received a lot of good questions today. Um, I fielded a few of them by myself, but I did take down a few here as well that I thought would be good for everybody to uh, to hear. And uh, the first one here, 
is uh, do you or buyers ever make negative addbacks to EBITDA when going from book to adjusted EBITDA? No, never. <laughs> if you're a buyer, that's the answer I give you. But in reality, um, what are we saying? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we, we have to, um, you know, some the same way that we did one-time expense adjustments, we would add back one-time income. So, for example, the BP claim, we were still seeing that. So a lot of businesses are getting some one-time income from those claims, and they're putting them usually as other income, um, you know, in that section of other expense, other income. So that's one extraordinary item that created additional income for the business that year that is not normal. It's not something that will potentially continue moving forward. So the same way that we did one-time adjustments on a positive side, we would have to add back that negative adjustment. Um, you know, for example, the BP claim is the one that is very common to say. Do we ever have owners that are giving themselves a market salary or maybe... I mean, they have to take some salary if they're operating the business real estate from the IRS, mm -hmm. but I think there's a pretty low number you can give yourself and then maybe get your distributions at a more tax advantage rate. Mm -hmm. um, we see it under yes. priced um, owner salaries a lot. Exactly. So if, yeah, if, if um, that replacement cost, even uh, if they are to be removing themselves from the, from the business and then a replacement person comes in, but they're going to have to pay that person a higher salary, then that difference has to be uh, taking into into account the same with the rent if the business is uh, or if the building is owned through an affiliated owned company and is not charging themselves rent uh, there has to be some occupancy costs that the new buyer is going going to have so that's another negative adjustment that buyers are going to perhaps want to invest. yeah I think um, so strategically so now that we've talked through the whole process from beginning to quality of earnings the, there's kind of two ways to look at those negative addbacks. One is um, that we just not mention them and hope that the accountant misses them in the quality of earnings, or do we just try to build goodwill with the um, buyers that we show the information memorandum to and who we show our financial statements to? And do we try to avoid any surprises? Do we try to avoid wasting time by, you know, getting that $10 million offer, but knowing that the quality of earnings is going to say, wait, you've and taking a salary that's way too low for you know the person who has to replace you, or do you just put that in the marketing materials? You know, and I think I, I always lean on advising sellers to let's get it out there. We know it's there. Like let's you know, and maybe maybe if it's under market by forty thousand, we go in and say you know it's under market by at least twenty thousand. You know, so you, you can be a little conservative on the negative addbacks, but um, pretty much they're. There are a lot of them that you can't hide, and that quality of earnings, they're going to dig so deep, they're going to find it. So it's, yeah, I, I think it's better to get it out. Yeah, as transparent as possible is better. What else you got for us, Wayne? Perfect. So um, another question that I thought was pretty good, Dallas had asked, do you utilize cash or accrual basis accounting or a mixture of both when determining valuation? 100% your question. I don't know. <laughs> so it really depends. Uh, we really see both uh, sides. Uh, most tax returns are filed on a cash basis. Buyers do prefer the accrual basis of accounting because it's closer to the gap. Um, so most buyers are going to be looking at the accrual basis of accounting, but if the business is run on a cash basis and both the internal statement and the tax return is on a cash basis, that's how the business is run and that's the way that we present it. But we are very transparent again on the type of accounting method that is being used. I think I think there's two two things I'd add. I think the size of the business is being sold also matters. I think as the as the business is bigger, buyers are more interested in accrual numbers. Yeah. And I think if it's a strategic buyer that uses accrual numbers, they probably would be more interested in accrual numbers. Um, but we don't take our clients from cash to accrual. Yeah. If they give us cash, we'll present cash. And we don't strategize over which looks better, cash or accrual, right? But we, we take what the client gives us, we present it. Sometimes the buyers want accrual. Yeah. Do we ever see in a quality of earnings that part of the quality of earnings is the buyer's uh, accounts converting cash to accrual? And does that ever affect anything on the purchase price, the enterprise value? Yeah, sometimes uh, it does. Um, but, you know, that's part of the strategy. That's part of what we... We are here to do to make sure that the value of the business is as high as possible. Um, so we want to make sure that the business is being treated the way that it's being run by the by the by the owner. Okay. Right. Well, so you 
you got for us. Wait, we have time for one or two more. Perfect, perfect. I definitely got two more here. So Tommy had asked, if you were looking to present your accounts to an interested party, do you suggest to put the ad backs before or after review from a potential part, from a potential buyer? So do you want to present it with the ad backs already in, or do you want to present it so, without the ad backs and then say, okay, these are the ad backs? Two part strategy. So if you're if you're doing you know what we do, which is prepare a client for the market, and who knows what type of buyer is going to show up, you want to get those ad backs that are universal in there so for example let's just look at compensation again we've been talking about it a lot so suppose you have compensation and you have excess um, compensation for the owner um, so you would add back the excess part in the marketing materials um, and then when the buyer shows up if it's a particular buyer that's supposed um, a trade buyer that's nearby and they're not going to need that owner's job you could then say oh we have an additional compensation add back we're checking out the rest of the the compensation because you as this particular type of buyer or this particular buyer aren't going to need to replace the owner so we're going to add back 100 percent so there's you have to look at your ad backs two ways one is an ad back that would be viewed as acceptable and, and logical to every buyer and then there's another set that would only be logical or acceptable to a certain buyer or a certain type of buyers so it's best to get all the universal ones laid out ahead of time but not, but not to try to claim the specific ones, right? So if we said, if we just went to market with the book and said, oh, some buyers aren't going to need to replace the owner, so we're taking off 100%. Well, a private equity fund would look at that and say, we don't want to come in and run your business. We want to be a capital partner. We want you to continue to run the business, um, or we're going to have to find a replacement to run the business for us. Um, so that we don't agree to that as an ad back. Now you're in a negative ad back situation. Now all of your ad backs are subject to being questioned. So that wouldn't be a good thing to do. Um, so if you're going to market broadly, put in the universal ones and then have a pocket full of the specific ones that you know about for specific buyers that you can raise at the time you reach into negotiations. It sounds like maybe this question is coming from a little different place though, which is if you are only talking to one buyer. So suppose you're not going to go out and try to get competitive tension and get the highest price possible. There's just someone you want to do a deal with. Um, with them, then I would definitely say lay out your best case right off the bat. Put in every ad back that you think they would accept uh, as a unique buyer right off the bat. Perfect, it, it's, it's an anchoring thing in negotiation that if there's a lower number in there that they see, it's going to be harder to get them off that number. Yeah, definitely. One more. Okay, and then for this last one, I think was a great question. Um, Leslie asked, what is the typical time frame you recommend for a company to start preparation for sale? Uh, so we had a um, we had a webinar a while back that's, that on this topic called why why grooming your business is a waste of time. Stand by that webinar, great webinar. Um, uh, but to summarize it very quickly, um, if you go out and groom the company ahead of time, what happens is you're focusing on the EBITDA side of the equation, which is great for today's conversation, but a very well-groomed business may have a higher EBITDA, but it's gonna get a lower multiple because whether they admit it or not in this valuation formula, the buyers are setting that multiple number based on what, in part, on what kind of quick wins can they get? What kind of improvements can they make? And if you've already made all the improvements, then your multiple is gonna be lower. Your EBITDA may be higher, but your multiple is lower. So that's the fundamental reason why I think grooming your business is, is a waste of time. It takes us to get a client to market. What is it taking us these days from signing a, an engagement letter with us, which is when most of our clients really start working on it, mm -hmm. and tell the clients on the market what's our time frame? I would say, you know, two months or something like that, Max. Um, it really depends on how much information, how fast of, uh, the flow of information is coming along. So when we have um, a seller that is very invested in the process and is providing information as soon as we are asking for it, then the process can go, you know, a little bit faster. Yeah, and then the two two additional things that say that one is um, that if you go out and groom the business ahead of time, you may think you need um, a better email system, um, and you may go out and invest in an email system, or you may think you need a better CFO. So you hire a CFO that's like two steps better than what you have um, and then a buyer comes in and they want you to use their email system so they don't care what your email system is you've wasted money or they appreciate that you have a CFO that's two steps higher but they really need one that was four steps higher than your CFO 
So now you've got an awkward situation and some wasted money. Um, so it's it's really hard for someone to come in ahead of time and say, this is what you need to do to maximize the value of your business for a seller that I have not yet identified. Um, every buyer is going to run this valuation formula differently. They're going to see different pieces of, as important to the multiple side. Um, so that's one thing. Second thing is there are times where we have taken clients to market and the market has overwhelmingly said, you've got some problem with this business that I don't want to buy it until you fix this business. So we had a client that would buy pallets of stuff and not, not immediately inventory and assign a cost basis to the items. And he would sell the first item on the pallet and say, okay, all, whatever I paid for that pallet is all attributable to that first thing. And the rest of the things on the pallet, the inventory value of them is zero. And when he sold them, it was 100% profit on everything he sold after the first piece. And buyers universally said, I can't buy this company because I can't get any debt when your accounting system works this way. So there are some issues that are prohibitive. And in that circumstance, we went to market with the client. The market overwhelmingly said, we can't do this. And we weren't going to find it that time on that one. Uh, said, we can't do this. And then we waited. And now we're back on market with this client. So they spent about a year. They made the improvements and went back to market. So, you know, very rarely, but sometimes there's something catastrophic. And it usually centers around like a, you know, complete absence of accounting controls. I think I think it's often. So um, that's 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 for my question. And I think we're probably out of time. We've run a little bit over here. Don't forget at the end of this time, there'll be a little um, questionnaire if you had any technical issues or anything. Um, and then if there are other questions we didn't get to, we'll make sure that we um, write to you. Thank you for your time. We hope you'll join us for our next webinar.